This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 184, about Iron Fist 210, A Jewel of Iron. Welcome back, fellow Defenders, for the final time this season for Iron Fist, Season 2, Episode 10, A Jewel of Iron. And possibly the final time for a while, we'll be playing our theme tune from Mississippi MacDonald. Thanks once again for that theme tune. Always enjoy listening to that one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Mississippi MacDonald, for the Iron Fist theme tune. I am one of your defendering hosts, John. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. And rounding out the group, I'm Chris. Welcome back, fellow defenders. Gentlemen, we are at the end of this season. We are here, 10 episodes down. So without further ado, because I know our fellow defenders are probably dying to hear what we thought of this episode. Um, I will start off by saying you can get access to everything over on our website at DefendersTVPodcast.com. We, of course, have Daredevil Season 3 coming up very soon. Uh, some may say almost too soon, but it's coming up very soon. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we also are continuing our Sorcerer Supreme coverage. Woo-hoo! The lovely gentlemen to my left and right are also, well, left and right in a different country, <laughs> are also <laughs> reviewing the latest Sorcerer Supreme comic books. And just because, you know what, we, we say we haven't got enough work to do, we're also going to be reviewing Venom. So... Head over to our website, subscribe at all the usual places, and make sure you don't miss any of that fantastic content coming up soon. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. And really, really important, if you're just subscribed to Iron Fist on Defenders TV Podcast, make sure this is the time. Pop on over to our website at DefendersTVPodcast.com and just make sure you're subscribed to the full podcast so you can get everything that Chris is talking about there. If not, this feed's going to be going very quiet for a while until we get the next season of Iron Fist or the next Iron Fist-related podcast. Yes, and of course... Please uh, head on over to Defenders TV Podcast and check out our recent interview uh, with the Luke Cage showrunner, Chio Hidari Koka, who was really uh, generous with his time and gave us a lot of insight in what it is like to be a showrunner on one of these Marvel Netflix shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, really uh, nice chat with him. So please head on over uh, to Defenders TV Podcast for all things Marvel Netflix. And in particular, check out Chio Hidari Koka uh, on our interview special podcast. Mm-hmm. But yes, without further ado... We are getting into our spoiler-filled review of Iron Fist, Season 2, Episode 10, A Jewel of Iron. Would you say that was like an emerald jewel or a sapphire jewel, you know, like or just a big (laughs) rock of iron? (laughs) I must say, yes, as soon as I said it, I kind of realized that uh, I came across more as a, a jewel rather than a duel. Yes, it is yes. a duel of iron. This uh, episode was titled after Iron Fist number one came out in 1975. Uh, in that issue, clearly the duel of iron in that issue was Iron Fist facing off against Iron Man on the front cover of that issue. Uh, what a great way to start off a comic book as uh, dedicated to Iron Fist than having Iron Man appear on the cover. Very cool. And this episode was directed by Jonas Pate. He hasn't worked in the Marvel Universe before, but has done loads of shows that we know and love. Things like Battlestar Galactica. He did Caprica. He worked on Blood and Gold, the prequel to Battlestar. So loads of sci-fi shows. He's also done loads of other stuff like uh, Dragnet. Um, he did Good vs. Evil, a show back in 1999 with his brother. Uh, done loads and loads of other stuff uh, in, in the TV world as well. But, uh, but back for an episode of Iron Fist. Excellent stuff, yeah. Battlestar Galactica, fab. And that is all there is to be said on the matter. Well done, Jonas Pace, uh, for bringing us uh, that. And Caprica, actually. I quite enjoyed that as well, Mm -hmm. I must say. And as we always say, when the writer of the first and final episode is the showrunner for one of these Marvel Netflix shows, it's usually a good sign. And this episode, as usual, is written by showrunner M. Raven Metzner. So, uh, yes, he's done a pretty good job. And always, as I say, a good sign. Yeah, excellent stuff. I'll be the judge of that. John, (laughs) do you want to tell us what he gave us in this final episode? Sure. With the transference ritual only half complete, the chi energy of the Iron Fist is shared between Davos and Colleen. As Davos flees the dojo back to his lair, time is against them. Unless the ceremony is completed, 
both will slowly be killed by the energy of Xiao Lao. But Danny and Colleen need Davos alive, and Mary Walker perches in his hideout, ready to shoot him. Fearing that killing Davos will also kill Colleen, Danny and Misty try to stop Walker. They restrain her long enough to bring back Mary. Meanwhile, Colleen and Davos desperately battle to keep the power of the Iron Fist, and with Danny's help, she defeats Davos to become the Iron Fist. In the aftermath of the battle between the two Iron Fists, Joy and Ward make amends, Bethany embarks on her pregnancy without Ward, Colleen forces a delicate peace between the triads, and as Danny cleans up the destroyed dojo, he discovers the Iron Fist symbol on the reverse side of the Wing family crest, taken from her ornate heirloom. Realising Colleen's potential lineage, Danny leaves New York with Ward to search for answers to the desiccated Iron Fist and discover his own path to and connection with the power of Xiao Lao. Months later in New York, Colleen returns to the streets of Chinatown as the new Iron Fist, combining her power with her family's sword. While in Hokkaido, Japan, in a bar, Ward asks a local gangster about a man named Orson Randall. But as things head south, Danny intervenes, summoning the Iron Fist as he channels the power through two handguns. Oh, so good. Definitely a way to leave it, wasn't it? I know. I, I wanted the other three episodes. I'm sorry I'm being greedy, selfish, uh, and all of everything in between, but um, I was just like, I absolutely want to see how he got Orson Randall's handguns, how the power came back, probably through the handguns, uh, but just fab. Loved it. And then the credits rolled, and I was like, no. Definitely set it up for a season three. Yeah, I really hope so. Um, that would be so cool. And to be honest, you know, we have spin off shows, Daughters of the Dragon, Heroes for High. You know, we've banded those around. Uh, I really want to see the adventures of Ward and Rand. Um, to be honest, I think that would be absolutely fantastic. We need like a couple's nickname for them. You know, we get like Brangelina. Randy Ward. That could work. <laughs> the Adventures of Randy Ward. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I just, I don't know, there was something about that final scene um, in that bar in Japan that just kind of reminded me of um, Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant for some reason. I just thought it was fab. I was expecting to see you know, sort of Nazis suddenly come into uh, the show or something like that. Really good. And we may still see that. But gentlemen, it's about time we jump on to our top five points and maybe even a special golden point in this episode. Mm -hmm. So jumping into point number one, Derek, do you want to take us away? Yeah, I like that this episode kind of closes out the series with the story of what the whole thing has been about, this whole duality of Danny and Davos. What would have happened if Danny hadn't gotten the Iron Fist and Davos has attained it? The whole piece is laid out as you see their original meeting, Danny and Davos, when uh, they've been best friends since, since the start. Davos has taken care of Danny as he arrives. He's still covered in snow from being outside and he's being fed by Davos. He's the one taking care of him. And I love this whole concept of Danny talking about the fact that he's challenging and pushing at each other the whole time to get to that final fight. And now Danny's finally questioning. Was that actually his destiny? Was that actually the right thing for him? Was Le Kung, who proposed that Danny was the person to win this battle and take the power of the Iron Fist, was he, was he right in that? Was this really Danny's destiny? Or did he just believe in someone that was telling him something that he wanted to believe in because he'd lost everything when he arrived at Kunlun? It's a lovely way of kind of setting up this final episode and this huge change for kind of our Danny Rand, our Iron Fist. Yeah, definitely. I think um, as well, it really looks forward to that moment uh, later on in the episode as well in the dojo where he is tidying it up and he comes across uh, Colleen Wing's heirloom that she had found in the community center and, and everything with the story of, of the Pirate Queen uh, as well. You know, it, it really hints at, at that aspect of, as you say, destiny or fate or, or lineage, all this kind of stuff, you know, how you got from one place to, to the next. Well, I think he starts with, you know, every journey starts with an ending or a finish rushing towards you, you know, 
um, because you've started that journey. So yeah, it was really good. And I like these flashbacks as well, seeing, you know, those different stages, um, of Danny and Davos, that idea that, you know, yin and yang, these are not opposing forces all the time that they change they move and are flexible over the course of time and you see this um through danny being cared for by davos sort of becoming friends then being cared for again after he's fought shao lao uh, to then this moment where they are uh against one another so yeah. i mean it really uh yeah really good stuff i really enjoyed um the these moments and i thought there was something quite tender about it as well actually which yeah. i thought was pretty cool yeah yeah i i, I like the the idea that uh, i think you, and you put it the duality of danny and davos in that you're, you're led to believe throughout season one and majority of season two that danny was always fated to hold the power of shadow Hmm. It is his destiny, the destiny to be the Iron Fist. And he bandies that word around quite a lot in Defenders, in um, the beginning of the season even, uh, when he's talking about, now that I've done and destroyed the hand, what is my destiny? You can see that Danny and Davos were cut from the same cloth hmm. all the way up to that defining point. Now, you could argue that Davos's mother probably had some nurturing uh problems that potentially <laughs> kind of the best way of putting it that potentially warped davos slightly but if it wasn't for that decision made by lee kung either of them could have been the iron fist at that diversion point then you start getting as you said that duality that yin and yang that one is very dark and believes in the the scripture around the the iron fist but takes it for every letter so mm-hmm. I must eradicate evil wherever I see it, and I see it everywhere. Yeah. Um, and then the other one, which is I see the best in people. And Davos calls it out to Danny when he's lying on the stretcher. He goes, like, you, you're you trying to comfort me. I'm paraphrasing now, but he essentially kind of gives out to Danny for being nice to him. They were the same mold up to a point. And then that mold fractured and you could see what the power did to each of them. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the, the interesting part about this piece at the beginning. It's that not only now is Danny questioning his own destiny and this old idea that he could be the Iron Fist at all or should ever have been the Iron Fist. He's also questioning everybody who's come into his life. Was that the destiny that the plan that was laid out before him was the plan, the destiny to just meet up with someone like Davos, battle against each other? because they're complementary forces seeking balance in the universe, the yin-yang idea, and eventually for him to carry the mantle of Iron Fist so that Colleen can attain it. It's a really interesting concept. We'll definitely go into it as we get through the, the rest of the points. But I love this whole thing that Danny's suddenly questioning everything around him so that he can rebuild his life and kind of get a measure of peace as well out of that. Just get a measure of peace in the fact that he's accepting Maybe this wasn't the right path for me. Maybe I need to find my own path. At just the beginning here, I think that's quite nice. But let's kick on to point number two, because the episode rocks along. There's so much stuff going on here. We see that, obviously, uh, Davos has gotten away after this uh, attack from Colleen and Danny. Uh, he gets away before the end of this ritual. But it cuts to Walker laying in wait for Davos back at his residence, I suppose. Uh, I love the opening here with uh, with Misty Knight trying to break out of that prison that uh, that Walker's put her in just to get her out of the way. And all we hear from outside is Walker singing the Mamas and Papas like it's just a nice, you know, average day <laughs> yeah. for Monday, Monday. You know, it's just a normal day. Why is it such a bad day today? Because I've got a bit of work to do. And the work that she's got to do is cleaning up the body of Chen Chen Wu, dragging him across the floor. <laughs> yeah. A great final screen moment for Chen Wu, the man that we yeah, complained absolutely. that we didn't see his name on screen for many of the episodes. That great final moment as he's dragged away and his blood soaked notebook that he's been using to get all of the members of the Golden Tigers killed is just lying left on the floor in the pool of blood left by his body. A nice little touch there for the director. Yeah, well, it was nice. It really was. Um, I must say, I loved the moment that Davos escapes uh, back to his, his lair where um, he uses the Iron Fist and you just see all the furniture going like crazy in the dojo silhouettes. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really nice touch 
see, seeing that. Um, yeah, this is, this is really nice. I, I like how she stakes out the place. You know, she gets up high into a perch, sniper sort of ready in, in a sense, uh, waiting for him to, to come back. Um, and I kind of like that little Alamo kind of moment where they're both hunkered down. She's like, I can stay here all day. I've got plenty of time, nowhere to go, and I've got a load of bullets. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Davos is the... I do like his kind of retort. You know, she's firing bullets. He starts firing breeze blocks back at her <laughs> uh, using the Iron Fist. I, I thought that was really nice uh, touch because I kind of felt it added that additional element. You know, Iron Fist punches through doors. It can block bullets. I like that idea of it using uh, or being used to projectile sort of objects across the room, very mm. like a gun. You know, he was using it like a gun. So I thought that was pretty cool um, for sure. But yeah, seeing Misty uh, sort of locked up by by Mary Walker as well. Mm -hmm. It's a shame Walker has those feelings towards Missy. I didn't think she would get locked up by her, you know, but nonetheless, I can, I can see that. I, I like that she uses her own iron fist to try and break out of the door. Um, takes a bit longer than, than Danny or Davos have shown in the past, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, uh, a nice little reference to a more mechanical iron fist. Yeah. Walker singing the mamas and papas is, is a Bendis pull. Oh, right. From one, I'm thinking, I'm assuming is Daredevil run? Probably, yeah. I know Mary Walker obviously is much more associated with Daredevil. Uh, yes. The, the, the character hasn't really been seen in much of Iron Fist, as we've mentioned before. So, most yeah, likely. it's been called out on Twitter. I remember seeing it a few times. Mm -hmm. It's a call back to that Bendis run. But additionally, because it's the Mamas and Papas, the band is made up of four people. They sing. What you get is in that panels, I think it was something like she singing. Monday, Monday, and you have her different alters talking and singing while she murders and just kills and does her thing. Nice. It was just a nice nod, I think, from Raven, mm -hmm. um, because, of course, that's where the, the, the character mostly comes from. I'm with you with the Chen Wu piece. I'm with you on um, Davos and Mary having their go at each other. Love that. I love this scene. I really just enjoyed the whole thing yeah I, I really liked that point with davos talking to walker across the across the area going um did joy put you up to this i don't see her around here yeah. first i'm gonna kill you and then i'm gonna kill joy and mary's response to it or walker's response to it just going uh that was like three jobs ago when she hired <laughs> me to get you now i'm just doing it for fun and he goes well how about i how about the two of us work together and she goes yeah you come on out just come on in from behind there and you start talking and then we'll see how far we get, you know, really good little interplay between the two characters who haven't really been on screen much, but they've had a really direct impact on each other over the course of the season. They haven't been together very much. Sorry, they've been on screen loads, but um, we haven't really seen the impact they've had on each other. But we know right back from episode three of this season that Mary Walker has a huge problem with Davos and she knows how dangerous he is. And she's not going to let him get anywhere close to her again. Really cool use of the character and really cool use of them. But it does take Misty and Danny working together to take down Mary. I like th that we do see Danny using his proper fighting skills against a really trained professional this time. He's not being taken from behind like he was when he got knocked out and dragged off to, to have the Iron Fist removed from him. He is fighting very strongly against Mary. But we get the introduction, as John kind of referred to, the Iron Arm of Misty Knight being used in here and getting destroyed by Mary. So we have now a Misty without her wonderful Rand assisted arm. Yeah, I love it sparking up actually. Mm -hmm. I just love the way um the the lines are delivered by by Misty Knight. Just that okay Rand Tech, let's see what you can do, you know? And I, I like at the end where, you know, we get that reference to getting an upgrade because obviously her arm's been sparking as uh as Walker's blades are, have kind of been cutting into it. So she, you know, she makes that reference to getting an upgrade and um, also then just sort of referencing the comics that she'll bling up the arm, mm -hmm. uh, possibly bling it up uh, in reference to the, the more sort of gold um, 
arm that she has, mechanical arm that she has in the comic. Mm-hmm. So that that was really, uh, really nice, I thought, to just get that little reference. And a nice little throwback to our discussion back in uh, in Luke Cage where we saw her get the arm and you guys were talking about, you know, you wanted to see another version of it. This is, ju- is just a prototype. We will be getting another one the next time we see uh, Misty Knight. Very cool. Chris, do you want to take it on to point number three? I do indeed. This is the one that we were waiting for to a degree. Colleen versus Davos. This was just fantastic. So the ritual was cut halfway. Both of them are dying at this point. They Because you're sharing... Well, they don't directly say, well, if we don't fix this, you're dead. I think Danny's saying it, isn't he? Danny's yeah, saying it. He, uh, yeah. he kind of says they need to connect to his anger chakra to complete it, to do that um sort of mind meld sort of <laughs> bit that she needs to do it in order to get the cat's eyes kind of thing where where they light up without completing this ritual um that yeah you do get the impression that they will die because it's not fully in one but even without that um you know the the danger is that Mary Walker will shoot Davos and kill him and as a result then that will mean that Colleen will die anyway because mm-hmm. he will lose that that chi energy. Yeah. I, I just like that Colleen really does go toe to toe with Davos in this. Yeah. Like she to the point where we get that beautiful she flares up her fist while he he's doing the jumping uh, punch down with the red iron fist mm-hmm. and you get that shockwave that knocks them apart. I love that too. Yeah, I love that you don't see the hands actually touch. You see the fists coming close and the energy of outside the fists rebounding off each other, like as if they're kind of opposing magnets, uh, opposing forces pushing each other away. It's it's a cool idea. It really kind of reminded me of that Iron Man Captain America moment in Civil War where the repulsors are blasting off Captain America's shield and blow the two of them backwards, you know, that kind of thing. It's that really iconic moment between the two of them. But kind of obvious that that would happen as well. They're 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 kind of using the exact same power on each other. They've both got half of it. So it's not the Iron Fist up against somebody else. It's the two of the same powers going up against each other. Yeah, it is telling that she needed Danny, And I, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. What I mean by this is that Davos was more powerful. Now, we learn that Colleen's more trained. She's more skilled in Kung Fu. Danny was Danny. He was the original Iron Fist that we know of. He has abilities elsewhere. But Davos was stronger. Davos was starting to gain an edge on her. Um, and I, I find it telling that Danny needs to help slow down Davos so that Colleen can complete the ritual. I think what's important here is Davos is obviously the person who's been using the Iron Fist more than anybody else. He's used it more than Danny has at this stage. The power has consumed him. That's why he's more powerful using it, certainly. This show has all has always been about Colleen and Danny since the middle of season one. It's always been about the two of them coming together and fighting this piece. What we have in the dojo, basically, when Colleen is feeling the power of the Iron Fist for the first time, she's have never had any preparation at all for this, remember. So she's feeling the burning of the dragon inside of her. And Danny's going, yeah, that's what you'll feel. But he never told her that beforehand. <laughs> she's crippled over in pain on the floor and Danny's going to her, you're going to have to stand because this is what having the Iron Fist is about. And he goes, I'll go and take care of Davos and I'll bring him back here. And she goes, no, I'm going with you. Um, the two of us will take him down together. Yeah, I mean, it's even after the fight, she says, I'm still getting used to this. Mm-hmm. And irrespective of what may happen now between the two of them. So, like, you know, she's certainly got a lot of uh, catch up. And I think in terms of using it and handling it. And I, I think uh, that's probably, as you say, it, it's kind of getting used to to that. And plus, yeah, as you say, she's kind of makes the point that we will bring him down together. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, this fight because I think it's got so much history, so much beef to it. You know, Davos has always uh, seen Colleen as a member of the hand yeah. that Danny has been wasting his time and in, in effect has betrayed Conlon by uh, being with her even. Yeah. Um, he, he calls her a hand whore uh, at the start of this series. So, you know, this has huge amounts of rivalry and bitterness between the two. 
even, you know, going back to the awkward dinner between Danny, Colleen, Joy and Davos, when it was all kind of so polite, that tension between these two. And I just think uh, it's a really great release in this final episode of these two going head to head, toe to toe and fighting for the Iron Fist, you know, these two Iron Fists coming together. I mean, I really thought that the fighting under those arches uh, was really epic, actually. I thought it was a fantastic setting underneath the, I don't know, the railway arches or, mm-hmm. or whatever it was, was just amazing. I, I just thought it was a great setting for, for this. Yeah, I agree with you completely because do you think there's a callback here to when Danny fought Davos in season one when in, he was in the park under the arches as well? Different mm-hmm. arches, but very similar. Yeah. I think it was just a nice probably kind of callback to that fight as well. Definitely. Yeah. Really good nod back to that, uh, for sure. But I, I thought it was really epic. I love that Danny, uh, gets involved to help her out. Uh, and I mean, even more so though that, you know, when Davos finally has that sort of juice taken out of him, uh, finally just the scream, the pain of, of, of all of that. You know, the face as he loses the power of the Iron Fist, I just think is so good. I think Sasha Duan does such a great, great job. And again, a nod back to episode two with the fight between Danny and him in order to gain the right and the privilege to face Shao Lao. You know, he just keeps repeating to her, end it, end it, end it. You know, it is that yield or die moment mm-hmm. again here. And he wants there to be a resolution it's you know it, it's the words of Le Kung um where he calls it in favor of Danny uh during that moment in episode two that is something that absolutely haunts him and he wants that moment almost to be resolved again the second time and and again the the tension between these two is just so good because, you know, despite him pleading, he's beaten and, and Colin just says, you know, and stay down after he's kind of come to attack her again. And, uh, she uses the iron fist, uh, and punches it into the ground to knock him off his feet. Uh, and you know, fully for the first time, because this yeah. is the first time she has control of the full power of the iron fist. Yeah, so really good. I, I just thought it was fabulous. Yeah. I love the movements of this fight that we talked about it before back earlier on in the season when some of these big, bigger fights are happening. The movements that are with them were just very smartly written. We have Colleen obviously arriving to do battle with Davos. But she doesn't know the Iron Fist. She's never used the Iron Fist before. She's never just lit it up at at her will. So what we have is her taking him on with just her fighting moves, just the actual training that she has before the hand and during the hand. So she's going toe-to-toe with him completely. And that's when he gets frustrated, as Davos would, and turns on the Iron Fist, punching the wall behind her and kicking her out into the street, effectively, to continue the battle. So, again, just a smartly written fight. And it's only after a bit of battling that she realizes, oh, actually, I've got a new a new weapon in my arsenal. I've got the Iron Fist that I can switch on now. That, I think, is why Danny steps in. It's not because she's not able to match Davos. It's because she's not used to using all the tools in the tool shed yet. And Danny has to step in to help her out and be by her side and kind of block her while she works out what she needs to do. That I perfectly better explanation than mine <laughs> as always my gentlemen are showing me the true errors of my way not at all not at all chris <laughs> i just thought that davos was stronger with more of shout out power right but gentlemen so the, the, at the end of this we do see that colleen is the iron fist she is she holding has, the power of the she iron is fist, yes. holding the power she uses it to make that shockwave, and Davos is down. Davos goes to jail, does not collect $200, and (laughs) just passes around. So that kind of brings us on to point number four. Yeah, yeah. I I did call this Davos Calls Out Danny, but we have already talked a little bit about that at the beginning of the episode. There's loads more that goes on here, really. This is kind of the wrap-up for everything, because the battle has been leading to Davos being taken down, and there's loads more that happens in the episode. I do like that Davos specifically tells Danny everything that he's learnt throughout the season Davos already knew about him. 
that makes it just so interesting that Davos is effectively saying to Danny, you never chose a path, you chose a destiny. You chose the idea of being the Iron Fist as your end point, whereas I chose a path. My path is, when I get the Iron Fist, I'm going to clean up the streets. I'm going to take care of every bad yeah. person out there. But you never chose that. At least I did that. Don't criticize me for not choosing a path. Everything went to hell because you decided to get the Iron Fist and use it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was really nice. I love, uh, he says, um, you know, I picked a path, I walked it. You still don't know who you are. And mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, little does he know at the time, but I think that moment where he decides to leave New York, Danny Rand is also thinking, of, you know, about those words from Davos oh, resonating yeah. about, yeah. I need to find my path. Uh, it's a really nice call out from Davos, I think, um, here again. He's defiant about why he took it and what he did with it. Um, no matter what you may think and uh, no matter how crazy and fanatical and bloody he became, um, he, he's, he's defiant and adamant that what he did was the right way of doing it. It was the means to his walking the path that was, was shocking. So I really, really enjoyed, um, this, uh, for sure. There's something I do wish they'd called out a little bit better in the show. Um, Davos states that he sent a message now and that message will resonate around New York. I think if we had another, another couple of lines in there during the season, or maybe if we had the other couple of episodes that we hoped we would get when we started out the season that we get our full 13 episodes, I think we should have seen what Davos going on his mission had done to the streets of Chinatown. All we really got was that conversation with Mr. Yip and then Davos flipped on him and killed him immediately. We didn't get to see the people of Chinatown feeling safer. We didn't get the pe- the people that were behind the Golden Tigers going into hiding and doing less crime because he was around. We did see them gather together and go after Davos, but didn't necessarily mean they were changing his ways. I just like to have seen, you know, maybe Davos get a bit of reaction from the public on the streets, declaring him like the hero of Harlem, for Luke Cage, declaring him the hero of Chinatown for what he's doing, cleaning up the streets. It didn't feel like we got enough of that in the show for Davos to feel so justified in saying to Danny, by me taking this path, I did something good or something good came out of it and a message to being sent. Yeah, we should have got basically our our, our Trish talk kind of segment in mm-hmm. the background. Now, obviously, we can't get Trish talk because of what happened in season two of Jessica Jones. No spoilers, but people can go watch that one. Trish podcast, I presume, is coming soon. Well, that or but additionally, like they they also have used the news mm-hmm. in Luke Cage season two. He used the news Absolutely. and anchors, and so we could have got that. That that's a thirty second, not even that's a twenty I, second spit. I think we needed more because we just got the police officer saying that he wasn't really reporting anything about what was happening and wasn't really following up on leads because, yeah. well, he wanted all the, the Golden Tigers either captured or dead. That's kind of what he wanted. So I just felt like you needed a bit more push from Davos saying that something else had been created out of what he did. Yeah, he said that my presence, this would be felt across mm-hmm. New York. Right? I straight away thought of two things. Well, I thought the same thing twice, I should say. One, Luke Cage. Okay. He is now controlling certain elements in Harlem. Mm-hmm. Does that mean he's talking potentially the Harlem people will have felt this across? That's that's one way. And then we do get a reference from Misty. Misty is talking to Colleen. Mm-hmm. And she does mention Luke and a need for potentially to call on Colleen in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, let's let's get on to there because that's also part of this point as well. Um we find out that Misty's not going to be taking the captain job, which is uh, one of the stories that has kind of been leaked over from Luke Cage season two. This is why Misty was in the area to help out Colleen so much was because she was taking a bit of time off from the Harlem PD to, to make this decision. But she kind of goes, well, I'm enjoying being on the streets. I'm enjoying having this power. If I become a captain, I'll be sitting beside, sitting behind a desk with the red tape. And then she does give that sly look to, uh, look to Colleen kind of going, kind of like the sound of the two of us working together and I know now that you have this weapon and you're a very powerful person I don't like the way Luke's going and you've got the only weapon in the city to take him down so maybe we should start up a nice wing agency <laughs> if only the copyright for that wasn't owned by in Bloodhaven or over in DC well actually Nightwing Restorations is the name of the company they use to front 
Daughters of the Dragon in the comic mm-hmm. books. That's right. But it's just, it, it's not talked about that much mm-hmm. because of a certain other Nightwing over in Bloodhaven. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, your Nightwing is slightly bigger than this Nightwing. <laughs> a little bit. I think he also has his own series coming soon on, on DC Universe, like every character DC is getting. I think. <laughs> well, no, he, he's going to be in... Is he in Titans? But even though he's dressed as anyway, that's for another podcast called Gotham TV Podcast. Make sure you check out the guys. <laughs> Literally, it's all about Gotham. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Once we once we end off doing um, all of the five or six Netflix shows that are coming up between the time, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now and the time when Gotham returns, uh, we will definitely be going back over Gotham TV Podcast. I promise. But it yeah. is a nice reference to yeah their their front as. Daughters of the Dragon, and of course to uh, that really popular DC character as well, who <laughs> resides in Bloodhaven. Um, but I love that link to Luke Cage, where um, you know there's trouble brewing in Harlem, and this time Black Mariah is certainly not attached to it. Uh, so I really like that reference um, for sure. I mean, we also really kind of see here Danny and Colleen really taking on board the fact that you know everything that's gone on there is consequences that will affect their relationship you know it needed to be done there were justified reasons and that they both still care very much about one another yeah but that it's not going to be the same and it and it can't be and i thought that was handled really nicely uh actually even with the letter writing you know danny goes up to uh the dojo to clean it up after Davos has smashed it up. And, you know, with that discovery um, of the symbol of the Iron Fist on the reverse side of the the Wing family uh, crest that's on that command that holds the brush and comb, mm-hmm. um, you know, he, he writes that letter to her saying, yes, you're going to be mad at me because I, I effectively have just upped and leave, but I have... As a result of all of this, I've got to go and find my own connection. It seems as though, you know, your family connection, your lineage it is through the Pirate Queen. You know, the story of Wu Ao Shi um, that her mother uh, told to Frank Choi uh, as she handed over the box to get these papers to, to move uh, uh, into New York. So, mm-hmm. like, it's a really nice uh, moment, I think, between the two of them, even though it ultimately ends up with them separating and, and going off uh, on their, their different ways uh, here. I, I do think it, it's nicely done uh, for me because I did have concerns when, uh, you know, they started up about Colleen would be her his sensei, would train him that... Does this really have to mean the end? And it kind of is, but it kind of isn't, I think, at the same time. I think um, the, there's a realization that um, things are different between them yeah, now. Yeah. And I, I, I thought it was nicely done. It's a nice way to leave it. Um, definitely, definitely agree with you. Because it feels like Danny's kind of going to her, I'll be home waiting for you. You go off and, and do what you need to do. He goes home to clean up the dojo. And by the time she's coming home that evening, I love her response, by the way, when he says that to her are we okay and she goes i'm i've got an iron fist now i don't really know yeah. what you want me to say about our relationship i need to work that out in my head but by the time she's arrived home that evening you can feel it in her she's much more relaxed in herself and she's kind of looking forward to seeing danny and see and starting to work in their relationship but by that stage danny's already gone so i think they're not as broken up as we thought they were going to be from that statement from her three or four yeah, episodes yeah. ago i think they've ended off in a good place and hopefully this means we're going to see these two characters go on in different ways in the future. It's not going to just be about the fact that they're in a relationship. Isn't that great? Uh, how do we keep this relationship together? It'll be about these two characters becoming their own separate people and also being together as well. I kind of like that as a way of having these two characters go on in a different way in the future. Yeah, I want them back together in season three. Essentially, the, what I get from this is that they are at... Some of the older generation will remember they are on the Ross and Rachel. We are on a break moment. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't think they're broken up at all. I think this is this is a point where Danny's now going off on his quest, which we'll talk about obviously in a mo. But Danny's going off on his quest, saying to Colleen, "If I'd stayed here and told you this face to face, I'd still be here. I'd never go off on my quest." She's now setting up her life 
the way she needs to. She's doing the things she needs to. I'm saying what I mean really is that it's nothing about the relationship at all. It's definitely not a friends moment <laughs> where it's where this will they will continually come back and break up and come back together. They are together. They're just away from each other at the moment. It's like going on a going on a work trip for a couple of months. That's all it is. Okay. I, I will agree to disagree on this one. I think they are temporarily Splitsville while they go sort out themselves, <laughs> sort out their minds, sort out their lives, sort out their iron fists. Because, you know, every couple needs a multiple iron fists. So <laughs> you just need to ensure which you have. Um, no, so I, I think they're, they are broken up right now. We will get we will see them back again later. They don't want to be, but they have to work on themselves before they can work on each other. Let's say separated. Yes. <laughs> But let's talk about Colleen and what she has to arrange. I like that she goes straight back to the community center just to make sure everybody's okay. It's, it's something that you really need to do in these shows. So often they end with the credits rolling and you're going, hang on a second. There was a huge big battle with loads of people that weren't involved in this and some people died and, you know, we saw them at the start of the season and what's happened to them now, you know? Um, I like that she goes back and has that discussion about what she's going to do for Rhino's gang. She's going to set up a memorial for BB and for his, the gang that was around him, people that knew him and people that didn't so they can learn something about his sacrifice for the community and how he lived within that community, which will hopefully give some other people a chance to strive and a chance to develop and grow. I like that that's something that Colin felt that she needed to do. And she also gets the commitment from Mrs. Yang that they're going to work towards some kind of peace, some kind of balance within the community. I don't think Mrs. Yang is willing to give up on their criminal ways. New. But she's also kind of saying, I won't put a foot out of line and we'll find some form of balance because I also won't accept if you go out and kill all my guys either. So, um, yin and yang. It's, it's the delicate balance of opposing forces. Yeah. Yeah. And that it may change. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's, it kind of feeds into that, that thread, I suppose. Cause it also goes back to the conversation that Colleen had with Mrs. Yang earlier on in the season. She was, got her into the whole parlay by knowing who, what, who Mrs. Yang was, what she was about, and the steps she was trying to convince Mrs. Yang to take were the ones that would gr- get peace, not get rid of all crime in the entire district, because she's a bit more of a realist than Davos is. Yeah, definitely. Chris, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this, because what I want to see is... Mrs. Yang now is essentially a criminal kingpin. She is both a leader of the, of the Golden Tigers and the Hatchets. Seeing Colleen and her go toe to toe, I, I I'd be very interested to see where that goes in, in in the future. But I'm hoping we see Mrs. Yang in Daredevil season three. Yeah, I was wondering that as well. To be honest, she is now a big power player. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it, it's like with um the head of the Italian crime uh, gangs as well. You know these. Two groups have, have been displaced. Um, and you kind of do get the sense from Daredevil season three that he is going effectively, you know, Daredevil smash a bit. I think, um, he, he really is not taking any prisoners. So you do wonder whether, um, she will come into the crosshairs of Daredevil as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm hoping there's going to be a little bit of a tie-in with those characters because a lot of them came in very late in the show and set up where they exist in this in this world towards the last couple of episodes of their shows as well. So hopefully we'll see that in Daredevil season three or Punisher season two. Maybe yeah. that's the only other the only yeah. other thing yeah. I could think of was Punisher goes on a uh, a Mrs. Yang and the Italians and a Kingpin and he basically it is now Frank's turn to take down all the mob. Mm-hmm. But it'd be yeah. interesting. Definitely. Speaking of taking people down, we get Walker returning to visit Joy. Mm -hmm. And I, for a split second, went, oh, Joy's dead, dead now. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's (laughs) where I was like, in my head, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, she's gone. She's she's a goner. Okay. Yeah. And then we get this beautiful spin on the head where we see Walker is now actually, she knows that Joy understands her. She doesn't want the money. What she wants is joy and joy's power and influence. And I'm like, oh, where are they taking this character in it? This is the thing about, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself uh, in the others. I'm spoiling what I'm going to be saying later is they set up so many of these characters 
in this episode for me going, oh my God, I want to know what happens next. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Literally cliffhanger moments. Definitely. I was like, really need these three other episodes. Um, I really, really do. I, I was the same. I thought Joy was gone. I thought we were going to get, you know, the, the third alternate coming out from, from Mary Walker here at this moment. You know, she even says herself, she's aware that it's there. You know, she always thought that Mary talks her way out of, uh, trouble in Sokovia. Um, and, and Mary always thought that Walker shot her way out to, mm-hmm. to safety in Sokovia. But actually she knows from, the the redacted documents or, or the full reports that Ward got her that there is this third alternate. I was absolutely convinced that when she says, you know, um and a trigger like a gun being pointed at the heart like Joy is doing was going to see this third alternate uh, come out. I really wish, there's part of me that really wishes that I'd seen it. I would have quite liked to have seen the third alternate. You know, this is certainly... um a character where the yin and yang doesn't apply because she's got three. She's split in three <laughs> rather than mm-hmm. two. Uh, I really like that idea that she is slightly different from this concept that Danny is talking about, about opposing uh, forces, that she has this third person uh, and third alternate as part of her DID. And I really thought that, um, yeah, Joy was gonna probably get strung up or something by this. I really like the kind of oblique references, you know, to Bloody Mary in terms of saying that the report said it was a bloody mess. Mm-hmm. And then the idea of, um, you know, I suppose disease or, uh, and typhoid Mary with, you know, poison is what poison does or something. Um, nice, yeah. you know, kind of an oblique reference to the, the, the typhoid Mary alternate. So, so maybe there's four. Who knows? Maybe there's more than three. It's the question becomes when she, when does she come back? Season that, three. You think it's just, just season three of Iron Fist? Do you think potentially we see her before that? I think it's interesting that they used her here. I think a number of people have mentioned that she is. A daredevil villain. She's a person known for being in Daredevil. We've just had her origin story in Iron Fist, which is, which is great. You know, this idea of getting this third altar that didn't come out during Iron Fist. And we could see that manifested over in Daredevil as a daredevil villain coming up in just three weeks time. So we'll know pretty quickly. Um, I think that's a possibility. The only reason I don't like that we didn't see the third, third altar in this season is because we don't know when she's coming back. That's the only reason I don't like it. I love the idea of having Mary and Walker opposing each other throughout the series and then Mary stepping back and letting Walker take over. Even in this, uh, in these scenes here where we saw Danny use all the techniques to get Mary to come back out so that Misty can take Mary away. What we hear from Walker when she comes back into Joy's apartment is, Mary didn't stay very long because she was so scared she let me back out again, you know? So they're, a, they, they're balanced now. The two of them are balanced now. But what we're learning is that there is possibly, now that you get a balance between those two, somebody else is going to be coming out. The question, the other question I have on this here is the conversation she has with Joy. It's very interesting because she lays a couple of, couple of little clues. I like the idea that she says to Joy, the reason firstly I want to use you is because you know both sides and you can manage both sides, which is a little technique that we saw uh, Joy use earlier on in the season. I love that backfired on her. <laughs> this idea yeah. that she was trying to get it, get her to pull Walker back out. It worked, but hell, now you've got Walker in your house with a gun pointed at you going, I'm going to make sure that you work for me now. And that other thing of saying, I want to use your power, influence and reach. I think that's more about dealing with this other altar. If it does come out that Joy will know instantly whether it's Mary or Walker or a third. And when she does, she'll have the power influence to take care of her. But I'm just not really too sure. But it's a nice synergy between what happened at the end of season one when Joy relinquished the company and ran off into the kind of arms of Davos to get revenge on her brother and uh, and Danny. And this season she's ended off with completely out of uh, out of her own hands. She's ended off in the arms in a way of uh, of Mary Walker saying to her, well, now you're mine. I don't want your money. I want your influence and power. Yeah. It's quite cool. Very interesting. Let's move on to point number five, because this is the, this is the, the show that we all want. The <laughs> Adventures of Danny and Ward. And oh my God, I'm so happy that Ward asked for more water. There was a split second. I went, oh, is he drinking again? No. <laughs> uh, 
I love it. I love it. Yeah, there's a couple of things that need to kind of set us up to get us to that final moment um, where we have. We talk mostly about the Danny stuff, Danny leaving the, the dojo and leaving uh, leaving the city. He's now on his quest to find his place in the world. That's really important um, because that's what he's been struggling for for two seasons is knowing where he is and who he, who he needs to be as a person. Well, now he's on that path. Danny Rand always needs a quest. But we do have Ward just getting everything stripped away from him once again. Yeah. You know, we saw him pretty low this season. There's been lots of things that happened uh, this season that, that left him pretty low. He does get a moment to speak to Joy, but that conversation between the two of them, there isn't a more brotherly, sisterly conversation that I've seen on TV for years where he's going, he's apologizing to her. He's saying, I'll always be there for you. And she responds with, yeah, whatever. Do what you want to do. You always do that anyway. <laughs> so she doesn't really care that he's going to be there. She just thinks he's doing that because that's what he always does. And then he tells her he's going to be a daddy, but he screwed it all up. And she goes, oh, well, what else is new? That's that's kind of what you do, Ward, is screw everything up, you know? So they have the brother and sister moment, but it's not exactly a heart to heart because this is the Meachams after all. Yeah, I mean, Joy even says, you know, our family is toxic mm-hmm. uh, and at least half of it is is dead. You know, that really says a lot about uh, her relationship with her brother hmm. but i do kind of like that there is a slight making of amends now that might be that joy is absolutely off her face on 50 cc's worth of morphine and <laughs> um, and that ward really is using that moment to try and you know reiterate that he is sorry and mm-hmm. um, but yeah th- this is really harsh on ward i think um because, yeah, you have that brother-sister chat in the back of the ambulance. I love the fact that he says, I'll always be there for you. I'll always help you if you want me to kind of thing. I, I thought that was really nice. Um, but also then, you know, he tries to go to Bethany to say that he will be there for her as well, in a sense, as well as finally taking on board her message as his sponsor, you know, that he opens up and and finally admits and talks to the group um that he is uh, an an addict and that he doesn't know who he is himself this just plays really nicely i think in, in two ways you know ward has always kind of projected skepticism about the process uh, about with his bringing of cronuts um having all his his lackeys uh, and his interns to to do stuff around this um but secondly I think, um, you know, Bethany kind of just says that after hearing that truth from him, she needs to move forward with this pregnancy on her own. Mm -hmm. Um, That's maybe not to say that something won't happen in future or whatever. Um, Unlikely, I think, from those kind of last words between the two of them. But nonetheless, you know, again, it's another stripping back, another kind of dagger in the heart of Ward. Again, he's being open, honest, truthful. And in that moment, it hasn't helped him. But I think this all kind of then links to the fact that, you know, when he goes to stop Danny or at least find out where Danny Rand or the Rand Enterprises corporate Jess is going he ultimately is persuaded by Danny that he also needs to find his path. He needs to find the way he's going and who he is. And I do think that that is done in some of the funniest ways um, with, with Danny doing that reflective questioning back onto everything that Ward says. I thought that was really, uh, really funny. I just thought it was a really nice moment for Ward that, you know, the rejection from Bethany, the, the morphined up joy being pretty honest and brutal mm-hmm. really sets him into accepting what Danny says and, and accepting that he can actually go with Danny to find out more about himself, more about his stepbrother, effectively, um, in, in Danny Rand and his friend now, um, and find out about himself. And I, I thought that was really nicely done. I'm so glad they've left Ward here. There's a certain TV show that I'm not actually going to mention the name of for the first time ever, uh, that uses this particular plot point for almost every character and did for the first three seasons. Someone that is remorseful about the fact that they may have used drugs once or drank a bit too much at a party once. And therefore, if they apologize to their friends and family, everything's okay and we can all get through it together. Uh, What we see here is a bit more of a realistic take from Ward. He's finally gotten to the first step 
on the program that he's been shunning for months and months and months and ignoring for months and months and months. And he's not told everything's going to be okay. And he's not told, yeah, no problem. You can join my life and we will bring up this baby together. He's told it's not fate. It's not destiny. It's just something that happened and I've got to deal with it. He's not told by joy. Great. You say you're going to be there for me. That's what I wanted to hear from my big brother. He's told, well, you're always going to do what what you want to do. I want you to step off, but you're not going to. So whatever you want to do, it's grand. I love that it's not as tropey as those other shows that have used this mechanism in the past, because that's not real life. And this, if there's one thing about Ward that we like seeing, it's him experiencing real life, um, even though he did deal with a father that kept coming back from the dead over and over again. Which which is real life. I'm uh-huh. just going to put that out there. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. As bad as you feel for Ward... Yeah. Bethany says no to him. You're like, oh, that that was tough, but it's the truth, and that's like that's what I really enjoyed about this element, which was Ward is left shell shocked when he goes to the airport. Mm-hmm. But that's life. Everything does not get wrapped up in a night nice little bow after 10 hours of your life. The fun thing about this was, and I think the bit the Raven wasn't afraid to do, which is he came in. He shook things up. Some showrunners might have been afraid and said, okay, we'll put everything back together the way we found it. We took all the toys out. We played with these toys and we're going to put them back in the way we found them at the end of the season. Mm-mm, nope. <laughs> no, like he's, he's took them out, shook them around, brought them out, played with them and went, do you know what? These are mine now. Yeah, and yeah. I'm planting my flag in them. And that's kind of where I saw it. And when Danny is leaving, Ward going with him makes sense. Mm-hmm. That's Absolutely. That part of where Ward goes, or where Danny goes, you're coming with me. Yeah. And he's like, no, you need to do this too. And again, we get this brotherly love that sounds kind of more wishy washy than I wanted, but it is the strengthening of the bond between the two of them. Well, that's the thing. Like that, that bond has been building throughout this season. We saw it a few times when they have some really good moments together after everything that went on last season. They have developed a friendship here. Probably Danny was the only person he was going to talk to that would have actually listened to him. And then he finds out that Danny's at the airport chartering a private jet to leave the country. Who knows where and who knows when he's going to see him again. Ward specifically says he's lost everything in this episode. That's his speech to the addicts group is that he's lost everything. And then the other, the only other person that he has to actually go and talk to is about to leave the country for possibly ever. So I love the idea that they get taken along. And I love that little slag about going to boarding school, playing rugby, a sport no one in the world cares about. <laughs> you can certainly see it from the American perspective. Why go to a boarding school in America and not and not play American football? Why would you play rugby? Nobody in America even knows what rugby is, really. <laughs> well, it sounds as though he may have gone to another country. He may have, yes. Um, but of course, as well, we do have to clarify that Wood does mean here rugby union. Possibly, John. <laughs> and not lean. Let's not complicate that. No, exactly. <laughs> There's multiple forms of rugby and still no one cares about them, people. <laughs> this is coming from a man who lives in a country where rugby is potentially one of the biggest sports or second biggest sports. And I still don't care. I prefer my American sport. My American <laughs> football, the true football, the one football, go Saints go. Nice. Let's get on to our sixth point because we did mention at the beginning of the season if we did have the opportunity to have a sixth point it would be our golden point just due to the rules of scoring for um kung fu and for martial arts in various sports so there you go so we do have a golden point because this episode is so filled months later it's called because these are the post credit scenes really aren't they these are the things that happen in a marvel movie that as the credits roll you go oh colin's actually now patrolling the city yeah absolutely very cool i've said it once i've said it twice uh, this will be the third time I say it. It just got my juices flowing for three more episodes. And I cannot wait for season three. I hope there's a season three um, for sure. Because, um, you know, seeing that uh, Lily White Iron Fist of, of uh, Colleen's and her glowing blade as well. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I, I loved it. I'm in shock that they did this. And I, I mean this in the, the nicest possible way. The fact that they decided to show Colleen in her blue and white comic ac- accurate tracksuit, the the white fists and glowing blade. Well, no, that's not comic accurate. But anyway, she got her super suit. Yeah. 
Yeah. This was the moment I was like, yes, this is beautiful. It's just so cool to see. So cool to see. Yeah, yeah no, it was really, really good. Yeah, and then, you know, again, really want to see uh, Ward and Danny and their adventures. Uh, as I say, I really got uh, that Indiana Jones vibe, I think, um, of the two of them in the bar at 4 a.m. Okay, they're not downing shots like uh, uh, Marion Ravenswood, uh, but certainly I love the vibe of the two of them in the bar Ward suddenly getting threatened by a guy that looked immense now okay he would probably be able to play rugby a huge huge guy <laughs> rears up behind the um the kind of gangster guy who has had connections with Orson Randall mm-hmm. um and obviously they're after these two as Danny stands up to defend Ward uh, unleashing, you know, and this is kind of on the other side, that his two iron fists with his dual guns as well, you know, the dual fists, the dual guns against these men uh, for, of Orson Randall's looking to get their property for their employer back. Mm-hmm. So really, really cool. Um, I loved how, yeah, the the bullets took out another bullet in, in mid-air. That was pretty sweet. And they looked like chi-filled bullets as well, didn't they? They Oh, everything was chi, It looked like the power was coming possibly from his new dual iron fists through the guns into the bullets, sending them on their merry little way to to blow blow another bullet out of the air. Two bullets hitting another bullet in midair. Deadly stuff. Yeah, chi-central. And it just looked very cool when he puts those guns back in his pocket and says, right, just don't try that again. It felt like a a real John Wayne kind of moment. felt like a real Western moment. (laughs) I really liked that from from Danny. Uh, Nice touch as well, as you mentioned earlier on, Chris, that we do have a really grumpy looking ward sitting at the bar at 4 a.m. And you think he's going to get another shot. You think he's back on the alcohol, but actually it's just a glass of water that he wants. And Danny's sitting over the other side of the bar with a, uh, with a beer in hand, just chilling out. So not as spiritual Danny as you may have expected in this moment. He's kind of just letting ward do his thing. It seems like they're, they're have a really good partnership going on. He's got the long coat as well. Mm-hmm. of Olsen Randall. The duster. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Mm hmm. So I'm going to call it. I don't think Danny's got his powers back. I think the guns yeah. are chi filled. I think yeah. that's why. But he's looking for Orson Randall, the the employer of these two gentlemen mm. who owns the dual guns. I will very quickly just say for our listeners, we mentioned him briefly in some of our previous episodes. But if you don't know who Orson Randall is, go read the Math Fraction Run. The Immortal uh, Iron Fist series. We get a you get a beautiful introduction to who he is. You get a beautiful introduction to who Wu Aoshi, the Pirate Queen, um, the Iron Fist, who she was. You get all this backstory. But essentially, Orson Randall was a previous Iron Fist, again a Caucasian Iron Fist from outside of Kung Lung, who came in and very similar to Danny Rand, um, mm. and then left. He didn't die. So this is again a oh, there is now another Iron Fist out there who there is still an Iron Fist out there who is alive with the Iron Fist power. Mm -hmm. So very interested to see where this goes because now we are getting into territory that is outside of any, I would say, or many of the comic books. This is not the Matt Frank should run. This is not going to pull on many runs that we know of. I don't think so anyway. Well, I think they're they're going to remix a lot of the stuff as they do in all of these all of these shows, you know, that yeah, that they really do take bits from all across the history, you know, everything from the names of the episodes this season to things that we've seen throughout the season to characters from other comic books like Mary herself. The referencing of Orson Randall here, I don't know whether it's going to have any major connection to the former Iron Fist Orson Randall, or whether it was just a little Easter egg played in there or put in there. Um, I understand this week we've heard that they have about three or four more seasons of Daredevil planned if they're willing to keep making them on Netflix. I believe the same from M. Raven Metzner. I believe in his mind he has a number of major arcs for Danny Rand coming up in the future. And I think this is just his way of laying down the bedrock saying, if you want it, this is the kind of stuff you're going to be getting in the future. And that gets me really excited. Exactly. I, I hope they continue to take Raven back for it because, again, he really he really did deliver uh, on this season. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really, really good only one thing left to do for this season of Iron Fist. Chris, do you defend this episode of Iron Fist, season two finale, A Duel of Iron? I do. This was a jewel of an episode. Uh, it was fantastic. I, I'm not going to 
Peter and the Bush, I am extremely happy with this episode. The way it concluded the story arcs, it closed off everything while also opening enough doors and windows to make me want and wish for more. I'm like, this was perfectly paced season. It was a perfectly delivered. They, okay. There was a few slowdowns, but the slowdowns were apt. And I think that was only for like one episode. I don't think it even bothered me that much based on what I'm recalling of what I've said in my defense. Overall, I really defend this episode. It was a fantastic. One of my top three closings. This is the episode 13 for this season. This is definitely up there in the top three. Um, I completely defend this season and this episode. Excellent. Excellent. John, do you defend season two finale of Iron Fist? I do defend uh, the season finale of Iron Fist, uh, episode 10, A Duel of Iron. Uh, I give this five Orson Randall revolvers out of five. Nice. I thought this was a really, really good closing. Uh, I think, as Chris has said, opens loads of intrigue, loads of doors into uh, a season three. It also is really mindful of itself as an episode in terms of the previous nine that have gone before. So you have the fight with Davos and Colleen, you know, the two that have been at loggerheads. You, you have this tragedy of Ward, uh, with Joy, with Bethany. You have these flashbacks uh, and the tragedy ultimately of Danny, um, and, and Davos, but that, you know, these characters have so much similarity and you're kind of seeing this with Danny and Ward as well as they head off uh, on these adventures. You have Colleen uh, using her newfound powers uh, and you you, you have uh, Misty here and with Walker. I, I just thought there was so much that spoke to everything that had gone before and really threw open the doors as to what a season three could do. And I thought it was really good and some really touching moments, some really tender moments um, between these. Again, a real nice, perfect balance between action and character development and closing off maybe in, in some cases. So yeah, I absolutely do defend this episode. As I say, if I was to say anything, it would be three more episodes. But Look, he has said what he's wanted to say in, in 10. And for me, it works because I absolutely thought this was a great ending uh, for the series. So, yes, I do defend episode 10 of Iron Fist. Excellent. So, Derek, do you defend this episode of Iron Fist? I absolutely defend this episode of Iron Fist. This season has been fantastic. And it's just because we've got somebody with the right hand on the rudder of this ship that is Iron Fist. What it feels like at the end of this episode, I mentioned that these final scenes feel like the post credit scenes you get in a movie. And what those are supposed to do is get you excited about the next season. What it feels like is he left everything on the table and then went, and look what else we've got coming up for you. While I do have, in my mind's eye, the other three episodes that are missing is episodes featuring Danny and Ward traveling around the world trying to find Orson Randall. That definitely wouldn't be what they'd be actually doing um, on the show. Unfortunately, we may get some flashbacks in season three to that, but this is really going. What's the best possible place we want to see all of these characters in season three? It's right here. So let's commit to it and say this is what we're going for next season. And hopefully they come back and hopefully they have a bit more budget and get the 13 episodes uh, for the season. And these are the kind of stories we follow because I love these moments in here. I love that we get everything set up from a team up of the Daughters of the Dragon to Ward and Danny together to Danny reaching Orson Randall. Loads of things going on. You guys have mentioned most of them. I love this episode and I really, really enjoyed this season. Uh, up there with the case season two as well uh, for this year. These, these two back to back have been fantastic. I think if I remember right, there's only been one episode that we were a little bit wishy washy on between us for the entire season. And we said in that one that if the next episode pays off, this episode will be even better. And I think. We've reached that point, really, where everything is all paid off. We just needed a little bit of a slowdown, 
uh, to just get some story exposition in there so that the rest of the season would make sense. And I think right now we've kind of defended everything right back to the start of Luke Cage. Really, really enjoyable. Let's hope uh, Daredevil can keep up this trend. Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm, I am hoping it continues. Otherwise, who knows? Matt may stay dead. <laughs> Gentlemen, should we move over to some feedback? Mm-hmm. So our first piece of feedback comes from Jeff Childs over on our Facebook group. Those final scenes, Colleen fighting with the Iron Fist and lighting up the katana, then Ward and Danny in the bar, Danny lighting up both hands and guns and bullets. <laughs> yes, Jeff. Yeah, we're right there with yeah, you. This definitely. is just like, ooh, ooh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cooler. Oh, <laughs> my God, that's amazing. Literally, it was like that Drake meme. It was just like better, 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 best. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff, for that. John Higley goes on and says, The last two episodes of this season had some of the best heart-pounding scenes from any MCU Netflix show. So damn good. Completely agree. Really fab you loss. Guns, bullets, hands lighting up, swords lighting up, fists lighting up. So cool. Faces lighting up. As yeah. Well. yeah. Smiles being cracked. Uh, and yeah, just really, really good, good stuff. Absolutely. Uh, Praline Prelim Martha says, absolutely loved this season and seeing Colleen take the mantle and her fighting skills was amazing. Can't wait to find out how Danny got the guns and got both hands to light up. It left me wanting more. Really enjoyed this season and can't wait for season three. Thanks, Perlene. Jamie Young wrote in to say, I absolutely love everything about this season. The pacing, the conflicts, the character development. It was everything I wanted and some things I didn't even know I wanted. Like (laughs) Colleen getting the Iron Fist. (laughs) Davos and Mary slash Walker were fantastic antagonists. Mm -hmm. Everything wraps up so nicely, but also leaves us with so many enticing things for season three. Like Colleen's family history, Typhoid Mary... Davos potential redemption, Joy and Ward being a family again, Ward becoming a father, Danny's new and improved powers. Mm-hmm. I'm conflicted about the shorter episode count because for once the pacing didn't drag for me. Artistically, it may have been a wise choice, but I was also so into this season. I wanted it to keep going. I really miss those three episodes. I feel cheated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, feel your pain. We're right there with you, Sammy. Yeah, I think I said back at the end of Luke Cage uh, season two that. If the writing is that good, like it was on Luke Cage season two, and you give them 13 episodes, give them 13 episodes. The writing for this season was so good. And I don't think it's because it was given 10 episodes. I think if it had been given 13 episodes, M. Raven Metzner would have done a good job with those 13 episodes as the new showrunner for the show. So it just feels like we were, as an audience, we were deprived of three great episodes that we could have gotten. Yeah, it it does feel like that. Completely agree. I think... Artistically, it sounds uh, and looks and feels like a wise choice that has been done here. But when you have that ending, you just want three more episodes, even if it doesn't make any sense. You know, I wanted to see an episode where the third Mary pops out and says hello, probably chops off a few heads or, or kills a lot of people. I wanted um Danny and Ward do, you know, the the tour around Tibet um uh, and how they get the guns and I want to see Colleen on the streets of Chinatown. Of course, not going to be like that, but yeah, miss the three episodes, but I feel as though it's absolutely the right choice. And we did hear recently from Jeff Loeb that he was the one that proposed it to M. Raven Metzner. He was at, he asked Metzner could he contain his story within the 10 episode order that netflix was giving to him so um so that's why it's been set for 10 episodes for this season it wasn't that metzner went to them with a story that would last 10 episodes it was that he was asked by netflix could he reduce the storyline down to 10 episodes so by having the squeeze we've ended off with an excellent season again i feel if we got the other three episodes uh, we would have had just a 13 episode great season so uh, like we did with the catch thanks so much for that jamie yeah thank you so much jamie alex anderson goes holy sh wow i have to say that was one of the best season ending episodes of all the marvel netflix shows first ward name drops orson randall then danny has two guns and two fists incredible i love the idea of colleen being related to an iron fist Very nice move by the writers, and her fist lighting up the katana was epic. Overall, I thoroughly enjoyed this season's pacing, action, and overall story. 
I thought 10 episodes worked well, though I really want more now. Bring on season three. I'll take Matt Murdock for now, though. Also, keeping Davos alive was good. I hope he can see the errors of his ways at some point. I'm also really glad to see that the daughters of the... Sorry, I mean Nightwing is definitely a thing. Keeping Mary's third altar still a secret was slightly frustrating. I really wanted to see what that's going to be. Though I can understand not revealing everything. More reason to look forward to season three, I guess. Yeah, completely agree. I really was hoping to see the third Mary pop a little psychotic head out. Um, but no, um, hopefully season three, maybe Daredevil season three? Possibly, Who possibly, knows? Yeah. Um, I mean, it could be that looking at this origin is a nice shortcut for the Daredevil season. So it's like it's straight in mm-hmm. uh, killing people. Yep. Or doing her thing, I and, uh, say. and they'll have that little uh, that little asterisk in the bottom corner of the screen as she arrives, going, "Check out Iron Fist episodes, yeah. <laughs> season two, episodes one to yeah. eight for her origin story." Love to see that. Love to see them do that one time, just for a bit of a laugh. Uh, thanks so much for that feedback. Uh, Selena Kisler says, "I'm very surprised that Davos survived the season. He's not one really to just roll over." Mary Walker was awesome this season. Great addition to this universe. Hope she shows up in other shows or team up shows. Multiple Iron Fists operating simultaneously is very intriguing for future IF seasons. Those last two scenes really felt like post credit scenes. I hope we get to see how Danny and Ward's bro trip got to that point. I can't wait to hear the podcast about Danny's latest version of the Iron Fist skills. You know, as we mentioned earlier out of the podcast, it is quite funny that we actually had four Iron fists or iron arms in this episode when you consider <laughs> that we also had Misty Knight taking out her iron fist to the door doing a move that Danny Rand would have done in season one with his iron fist. So, yeah, I so many iron fists. Yeah. I think I did see a meme from people that weren't particularly happy about this choice uh, on, on Twitter with Oprah Winfrey going and you get an iron fist and you get an iron fist and you get an iron fist. <laughs> um, but I think it was a great choice to kind of finish off the season. If you don't have the time to build up all of the mythology of Kung Lung, get people excited about it. Show them what you could be doing if you get more seasons. You know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was certainly jam packed with uh, skills on toast here. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I was um, actually more surprised that Joy survived the season after Mary <laughs> Walker led herself into her apartment. Um, Davos, you know, I still think there is a steel serpent um, arc in, in in him there. I, I, I think they've not really fully covered that, actually, uh, in that sense. Uh, I think there's more to explore of Davos as... The Steel Serpent. I, I, I really do think that. And I, I think more about him kind of just descending into pure evil, really, mm-hmm. really being the bad guy. Because there were a lot of times in this season where there was a bit of empathy with him or, you know, the understanding, certainly as they explored uh, some of his backstory and, and why he got to where he was and why he wanted to conduct this ritual on Danny Rand. So um I'm I'm glad he survived though. I I, I really am. Yeah. But uh yeah, thank you, Salim, so much for the comments. Uh it's really good to have them in. And if we get any more feedback in before this episode releases, we're going to drop it in right here. So we won't have Chris, unfortunately, for any other pieces of feedback that come in. But thanks so much for everybody that's dropped in their feedback so far. Yes, unfortunately, I can't make it. But just imagine me agreeing with you with anything <laughs> you say, because most likely we all, fellow, like all fellow defenders, are on to the same wavelength about this season. Of course, if you're saying something crazy, just imagine me just nodding my head or actually shaking my head in disgust. <laughs> As I just said there, Chris has gone off now, so it's just myself and John for the final few pieces of feedback that's come in since uh, we recorded our last episode. Hello. (laughs) Our first piece of feedback came in on email from our fellow defender, 108 Sage, uh, to feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com. 108 Sage says, hi again, fellow defenders, the 108th Sage here. Again, probably after you've already finished episode 10. First off, I'll apologize for my tendency to write in either just under the wire, too late, or not at all. Just under the wire, I think, this time. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you worry, 108 Sage. You have 
made the cut mm -hmm. you've made episode 10 yeah always write in even if we can't pick it on the podcast we always love hearing from you anyway about it she goes on to say now onto the important stuff wow season two of iron fist has been amazing i thought season two of luke cage was without doubt my personal favorite of the marvel netflix tv seasons but now i'm starting to wonder if it will fall to this one the shortened season might end up being the deciding factor one way or the other depending on how the last episode goes but just wow so good so many good elements. Typhoid Mary was done better than I've ever seen her done in comics. So many good Daughters of the Dragon moments. So good to see Danny's progress from what I felt was an unrealistically immature starting point to facilitate the plot of Defenders through that awesome cameo in Luke Cage Season 2 and now even further where he has learned, at least in part, how to control his rage and petulance. Two qualities I've never really seen in the 616 Danny Rand. Also, Joy Meacham, one of my favourite characters in Season 1 and her arc, here has been great although i about had a heart attack when davos almost killed her and then when i saw all the blood around her head the plates in my skull started aching in sympathy and finally i'll just spend a moment on the new iron fist at the end of episode eight i was in a confused land of ecstatic worry sorry i did not see danny offering the iron fist to colleen coming at all on the one hand that'd be awesome but on the other would her being the primary Iron Fist in season three of this show in any way delay or derail any potential Daughters of the Dragon show? Because I'm not sure I'm here for that. And so, when Colleen started episode nine by putting Danny in his place, I said, Swear Jar Sound? Yeah, girl, you tell him. But wow, the last few scenes of episode nine and Colleen's evolution of acceptance, I'm willing to see her be Iron Fist, at least for a while, so long as we get some good Colleen Wing and Misty Knight action in all further seasons of any applicable shows, which is just as good a time as any to say that I'm fine with any non-canon romances that feel right and make sense for the show, especially if it'll end with Colleen and Misty as more than one kind of partners. In a world where Korosami is canon, Nightwing can be too. Uh, Kor Korosami is from Last Airbender, uh, from those cartoons, so they have a, a ship that was going on for quite a while within the fandom and has now been confirmed as a canon ship. I had to check that one out because I wasn't sure exactly. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. What I'd say is really good to hear from you again all about your thoughts about this season. I hope you're as happy after episode 10 as you were in episode 9. Um, I think where we've ended on episode 10 is that Colleen will probably be an Iron Fist going into season 3 or into at least her next appearance. But the way this series ends, we do at least see Danny back as being an Iron Fist or having two Iron Fists at least. So. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's kind of upgraded really because he mm -hmm. could only get one Iron Fist going um, up until that final episode. Uh, episode 10 mm -hmm. but i suspect that has something to do with the guns if obviously the chi and the energy of Xiao Lao has moved over to colleen wing which yeah i agree is completely awesome i just think it's pretty beautiful actually i i love the different colors that they brought to the iron fist over this season with the davos red the classic yellow of danny rand and then this lily white of colleen wing really just very cool i think mm-hmm so yeah, big thanks 108 uh, for that feedback. Really, really good. Yes, my heart uh, almost stops as well when Davos pushed Joy <laughs> over that banister or that railing. Um, really, yeah, she's a great character. Mm -hmm. I think there's so many good character elements uh, in this season, and I would agree. I think it really does um, go up there with Luke Cage Season 2, Jessica Jones Season 1, uh, really good series and daredevil season one don't want to, don't want to uh, negate that that's also a great series i mean we have daredevil season three coming up hopefully that can keep up this momentum it's been really really good uh, one thing i will say though one of um this version of danny rand is not unusual from the comic books the version that we saw in season one of danny rand he has been petulant at times that is part of his character he's had loads of different writers over on the character over the course of the last 40 years or so so there are different versions of him he's not always been the confident cheese centered character that we've seen in some of the uh, cartoon versions and some of the more recent comic books things like the immortal iron fist we have seen versions of him where he is just the blonde haired blue eyed rich boy uh, from new york who happened to come back to new york with the power so um so i'm not I, I wouldn't say it was totally out of character seeing him in season one but i do like what they've done throughout luke cage and throughout season two of iron fist i like what they've done with them so uh, it's interesting again to see these two characters being the central characters of iron fist having colin wing and danny rand being central in the show as opposed to just being about Danny Rand and his experience 
becoming a member of the Heroes for Hire, really, which is all that would lead to if you didn't have any other good characters surrounding them. That's all. That yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's been a good character development um, across both seasons of, of Danny Rand. I, I, I kind of agree, uh, 108, that, you know, a little uh, too immature. I think that's more of it, but um, certainly... Yeah, the character arc has been fantastic. So mm-hmm. thanks again, 108, for the feedback. It really, uh, really is appreciated. And as I say, even if you can't make it to send us in feedback during the time that uh, that we're recording Daredevil, send it into us anyway. We'll always talk about it. So, And we'll respond to you by email if we, uh, if we don't get you on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. We have some more feedback in from our Facebook group over on facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Defenders TV podcast. Mike in Cleveland says, While I really enjoyed the season, I feel cutting down to only 10 episodes was a mistake here. Mm -hmm. Everything felt a little rushed and or forced here at the end to me. Not really a fan of the tag, you're it, I am fist solution. Don't know if that's a comic book thing, but in my opinion, Colleen being able to control something Danny and Davos fought and trained their entire childhood for just to earn the right to fight a dragon to attain cheapens the power itself. I can accept Davos stealing it, but some amateur off the street just taking it from him? That's a shaking my head moment, in my honest opinion. Hopefully they will correct this immediately in Season 3. Thank you, Mike in Cleveland, for that feedback. Um, Yeah, I I think it's certainly uh, something that has maybe had differing viewpoints in terms of Colleen being able to control that power of Shao Lao. I do like the, the way, though, that she does struggle with it in terms of the the pain and the discomfort that sh- that she feels here and mm-hmm. um, i i think in terms of her ability to do it it may hark back to the pirate queen possibly that there is mm. something in there um but also that her training you know goes back to her grandparents just as much as bakuto uh, with the hand so there could be something obviously that we've not heard at this moment within Iron Fist that really explains why maybe she is able to do this. Maybe, but I certainly wouldn't characterize Colleen as being some amateur off the street. I kind of get the feeling that what we see about the training of Danny and Davos is that they're training for the battle to earn the right to fight against the dragon, but not necessarily training to hold the power of the Iron Fist. Would, Would that be... A bit more accurate, John, I'm not sure. I think the training that they went through is to make them the best martial artist. And then when they get there, they have the fight with Shao Lao to attain the power of the Iron Fist. And then there was supposed to be some training happening for Danny to allow him to hold the Iron Fist, which we saw in season one, he wasn't able to. And we saw throughout season two that he has been too emotional to hold it. And that's what Colleen was trying to help him with. We see Davos has attained the power of the Iron Fist and he also succumbs to the anger of Shao Lao and also can't hold the power of the Iron Fist. So what we're seeing at the end of this season is that Colleen didn't go through the training to fight the other people that were there to get to the fight against Shao Lao, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But she has gone through training and she is a more centered person than both Danny and Davos ended off being with that power. So I think what we're supposed to be learning here is that she's not somebody just off the street. She is somebody that has had many, many years of training. Whether that's something that they will explore in season three, very likely they will. They will give us more detail about her past and her history with Kun Lun, if that's what they think is needed to kind of justify her being able to hold this power. But right now, everything that's been told to me in season two tells me that she was given the power by Danny and can hold it because she is a more centered person than both Danny and Davos are. It's kind of where I'm seeing it. Yeah, no, I, I think that there has been training and I think she is able to deal with the, um, I suppose, the psychology of holding it. She, yeah. As you say, she's much more balanced and much more centered, especially when you compare it to Davos and, and even to Danny, who uh, himself acknowledges that he was not able to deal with it um, in in the way that he had hoped. But yeah, no, that's a really good viewpoint, Mike. Um, yeah. and, and thanks so much for that. It just feels that there's something that's missing from the show that's never actually told us that the guys are being trained to hold the Iron Fist. It never really seems to have underlined that. So 
it, we may be getting that mixed up with our knowledge of the comic books that that's what the training was. So just want to want to say that that's probably something that we'll see a bit more of in season three. They'll underline a lot of these things that we saw as being a little bit missing from season one and season two. But I think the idea of her taking on the Iron Fist was was absolutely fine. But thanks so much for your feedback, Mike. It's always good to hear another side of the story. We have some more feedback through from Tori Ekinogli. Uh, I really loved this episode and I'm sad it was only 10 episodes. My takeaways, Ward is the best. He's always saying what I'm thinking. He totally grew on me this season. I kind of wish Davos killed Joy. Not because I don't like her, just it would have been a bold move. I'm surprised we didn't see Zombie Dad Harold at all. I was totally expecting that, and it never happened. Mm. I love how this season really challenged our expectations. And lastly, I have a feeling... Having Colleen take the Iron Fist may be a way to soften people up to the idea of someone else taking over another hero's role, which is sure to happen after Infinity War Part 2. If one of the main heroes die in the next Avengers movie, I'm looking at you, Cap, someone else may have to pick up his shield. So this may have been done to introduce that idea to newcomers. Just a thought. Thanks, Tauri, for for that. I definitely um, think that's a great kind of idea, actually, that it it certainly does help uh, introduce people to the idea that you can have um, new people picking up the shields. You know, with Cap, it could be Bucky Barnes. But, of course, even, like, with uh, one of my favorite characters, Doctor Strange, you know, you've had Brother Voodoo take on the Sorcerer Supreme Loki. mantle, and you've had Loki very recently, so... Uh, it, it's and certainly it, something more through the centuries as well john don't forget yeah, yeah so it's <laughs> certainly something that 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 bond idea of people taking over the role should you know i, I hopefully they'll get and and they'll be um good with and in terms of your takeaways i think ward is fantastic mm-hmm. I, I do know what you mean he f- comes across as being massively um human and natural if if you understand my meaning and i really do think uh, it's a great character to have when you're you have dragons and i think that ability whether they linked ward to danny in terms of that addiction towards the different vices was a really nice move actually and i i I must say i really enjoyed that yeah i think yeah it's certainly challenged expectations with having colleen take on the iron fist and it was something that i really really liked and yeah who would not want to see sweet zombie daddy harold uh, (laughs) return um yeah, I don't know how they would have fitted it in, but I must say um, it would have been good uh, to, to see Harold Meacham back in, in zombie form. And of course, yes, instead of just a spin out of Heroes for Hire or Daughters of the Dragon, we could get Marvel zombies spinning out <laughs> on that. Netflix. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I think I was expecting him in the traditional Netflix flashback episode where we see Ward flashback to something rather than just telling Joy how she was treated by Harold, perhaps seeing how Harold treated him in the past might have been a way to do that. But uh, unfortunately, yeah, we didn't didn't get to see Harold uh, this season. And also to say, Terry and Mike and 108 have all said uh, that 10 episodes feels like cutting it cutting it down was a bit of a mistake and um, just to say in case we didn't mention it enough on the podcast itself yet we totally agree with you and um, 10 episodes feel, felt just a bit too short i still think that raven metzner the the showrunner for the show had decided that these were his final scenes so i don't think we would have gotten anything after that if we got more episodes i think we may have just gotten more episodes in between when colin took on the mantle and when ward and danny went off on their search but I would still would have loved to have seen that because this, this season has been fab. Most definitely. Um, Robert Phillips also uh, has feedback and says, such a lot of wow, no? Oh, did they really? <laughs> Very much enjoyed these last two seasons and where we are going in the future. With the heroes on tour, the grand niece of the dragon, <laughs> Misty plays the blues and the Meacham Bunch post-millennial relaunch. Do you think the Punisher and Davos could team up and become the sons of hygiene? <laughs> um, I don't know, but certainly uh, that would be an interesting team up to see Davos on the Punisher. I suspect Frank Castle would literally use his iron 
M4 rifle butt and uh, smash that into uh, Davos. I don't think he would have much patience for the impatient Iron Fist. And entitled Davos. Yes, I don't, can't really imagine them working together, but really good thoughts. Thanks so much, Robert. And thanks so much for all of your feedback throughout the season. It's been really good fun hearing those. Final word for this episode and this season of Iron Fist goes to Jim Carrey, who says, I finished season two and I am very satisfied. Certainly the most linear and perhaps best rendered Marvel Netflix season yet. Rather than overreaching, the story went deep. I care a lot about each character and every combination of interrelationships. Despite a few gripes, I'll save for the right time. I'm very, very happy overall. Excellent. Excellent stuff, Jim. Yeah, I think overall... We've heard very positive feedback about this season. There's been a few gripes, obviously, on in some groups that were looking for the Iron Fist comic book translated directly into the TV show. I think what um, Raven Metzner has done this season by, you know, seeing where the show ended at the end of season one and where the character ended at the end of Defenders, he it feels like he's moving the pieces so that we can get a much more Iron Fist show over the next few years. And I think he's done a really good job of that, personally. But it's really good to hear all the feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jim, for the feedback. And thank you, everyone else who has given feedback for episode 10. But throughout this season of I'm Fist, it really is great to have your thoughts and discussion points and comments in on Defenders TV podcast. Mm -hmm. It's great to share the thoughts within the fellow defending community. (laughs) And keep sending them in as we get into Daredevil later this month. And yes, we're moving on to Daredevil on the next podcast review. So make sure you've subscribed to us over on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts uh, just by searching for Defenders TV Podcast or going to our website, DefendersTVPodcast.com and uh, picking up on any podcast catcher that you want to follow us on. But we're not the only ones that have been doing reviews this season. We had a review over at Apple Podcasts for our own podcasts. Uh, Skiz7 says the perfect Marvel Netflix podcast and gives us a five out of five review. Thanks so much, Skiz. It's really good of you. Yeah, thank you so much, Skiz7. Uh, That's really nice of you. Uh, And it's really nice for people to subscribe to the podcast, but also to rate us and to leave a review is really good because I think we also learn a lot from those reviews. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Skiz7 gives his top five about Defenders TV podcast. He says the hosts are very professional. Two, the podcast has an active community. Three, very entertaining personalities. Number four, won't bombard you with PC anecdotes like some Marvel Netflix podcasts. And five, not just a Netflix podcast. They even cover some of my favorite comic books currently being released, like Doctor Strange. Well, there we go. Thank you, Skiz7, because, yeah, Doctor Strange, a fab fave comic of mine as well so uh, Mm -hmm. good to have you on board not only for the marvel netflix stuff but also for strange tales which is our little comic book corner on defenders tv podcast Mm -hmm. where we are yes absolutely looking at doctor strange um and yeah very entertaining personalities I'm always laughing at the other two. Sure. <laughs> it's really nice of you to say, Skiz, and really nice of you to say that too, John. Thanks so much for <laughs> uh, thanks so much for that review over on uh, on Apple Podcasts. And if anybody else wants to leave us a review, please do so. And if you're leaving it in any other country other than Ireland or the UK or or the US, um, please just pop us an email and tell us because we don't always check all of the individual countries. So uh, we'd love to have a review on there and just pop us over an email at feedback at Defenders TV Podcast to let us know if you've left us a review. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Gentlemen, the end of another of the Marvel Netflix shows, the 10th Marvel Netflix season so far. After four years, we are 10 seasons into the show i do wonder often and i've said this to the guys off air i do often wonder if viewers to the netflix shows see all of these shows as connected and we're now like at the supernatural level of a tv show where we're 10 seasons into this overarching piece of content and people don't or people feel intimidated about jumping in at any point but for me they're just getting better now we've had two seasons back to back that have been awesome and we're going into the biggie really daredevil the one that started it all In just under a couple of weeks' time, it's coming out on October 19th. We will, as always, be doing episode-by-episode coverage for for that season. We do have another couple of things that we will be covering before we start up on our Daredevil coverage. We will be continuing our Doctor Strange coverage with Doctor Strange Sorcerer Supreme of the Galaxy Part 6, our comic book coverage over on Strange Tales on Defenders TV Podcast. And there is another Marvel movie coming out. Well, a Sony movie based on a Marvel property. 
Venom starring Tom Hardy is going to be coming out on October 4th, and we will be reviewing that because that kind of fits in with all of our Summer of Spider-Man coverage. We still don't know how much Spider-Man type universe stuff will be in there, but we know it's Sony and we know they're trying to promote the whole thing. So uh, hopefully we'll get some references to little Tom Holland and his version of Spider-Man in that very scary looking Venom movie. Yeah, I really hope it's good, but I am looking forward to it. I am looking forward to it for sure. I, I'm cautiously optimistic um, from what I've seen of the TV spots um, and the trailers. I, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that's supposed to be good. Either way, it's a fun way to spend a night or a day or at least a couple of hours in your October while you're waiting for October 19th, the big one. What will we be doing on October 19th, gentlemen? We'll be returning to Daredevil. Yes, we will. Season 3. Or watching Making a Murderer Season 2. For some reason, they're releasing that on the same day on Netflix. Why would you do that? Why would you release two of your biggest shows on the same day on Netflix? Crazy. Because you can alternate now. So the thing is, Making a Murder is really just about Vincent D'Onofrio as the kingpin. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Excellent <laughs> stuff. Good job. Looking forward to getting back to uh, to some more podcasting and thanks so much to all of our fellow defenders who shared their thoughts throughout the season even if you didn't share your thoughts as long as you just listened to the episodes and enjoyed them as much as we've enjoyed recording them uh thanks for joining us for the season been really good and thanks to you two guys as always thank you so much fellow defenders and thank you to my glorious co-hosts they are the reason i get up and podcast each and every no, night a week <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, fellow Defenders, for tuning in and listening. It is, as always, a pleasure speaking with you. And, of course, it is equally a pleasure speaking with you and discussing things with my fellow co-hosts, Derek and Chris, on all things Marvel Netflix. So, don't zen koa me, people. I love that. Bye. Bye. Speak with you again soon. Bye.